Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Drawn This Way. My name is Mikhail, and joining me is my very good friend, Iranga. Iranga, what are we doing here? Good evening, Mikhail. <laughs> I guess you could say uh, we were both interested in sharing the experiences that come from being part of a larger diaspora, but uh, even more importantly, hearing some of the other stories uh, from artists, writers, readers, I mean, heck, even, even other collectors in this incredible space that we have with illustrated storytelling. I, I couldn't agree more, Iranga. We both have some experience living in different environments and learning to navigate new spaces that come with different sets of rules and social norms. It's something I know I really struggled with growing up, but now that I'm older, I really treasure the variety of experiences that I've been able to have. And I know you've been around quite a bit yourself, but our combined lives, life experiences absolutely pale in comparison to the absolute legend that we are lucky enough to have joining us this evening. Mikhail, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a little ridiculous to even, even attempt to introduce this person, right? Um, his name is synonymous with humor, illustrated storytelling, uh, the general environment of comics, um, traveled the world, worked on just about, it's not an exaggeration to say he's worked on just about everything and shaped uh, multiple generations of storytellers that came after him. Uh, we're beyond, beyond honored uh, to be joined by the one <laughs> the only Sergio Aragones. I don't want to hear any more compliments, please, please. <laughs> oh my God! I'm just... Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for the, the intro. That's very humbling, humbling. Sergio, uh, as you as you look back on the journey of your life, right from Spain to France then Mexico, and then finally here to, to the United States, not to mention everywhere else you've been in your travels, but uh, what cultural influences do you carry with you uh, that shine through in your storytelling and your art? Well, that's a, a very simple question. As a kid, when you're, the, when you're a cartoonist, a writer, a musician, if you really love it, probably you have started as a very young person. I, I understand that people can go to college and learn an art and become excellent, no, no, no questions about it. But there's a lot of us who sort of like did it from the beginning. I remember I was born in Spain, but I left when I was six months old. So I don't remember a physical learning from it because we, it was during the war, the Spanish Civil War, so we went to France. And in France, I grew up for six years. I was there in, on the section that was occupied by the Germans, who was the Vichy section. But it, it, it was during the war, so it was very hard to get new things uh, at the time. Many magazines stopped publishing because they were a little more to the left than the political organizations. Franco have hit, uh, helped Hitler, so a lot of things were not allowed. But even that, there was a lot of French uh, bande dessinée or uh, uh, books for children in France, which was the first ones that some of the relatives that came or sent to Spain to, to uh, via the underground in a way were comic strips and comic, but well, not comic strip, American style. That's so American. There's there's no other country who does that as much as the United States. The comic strip, but the comic book which in Spain are called te veos, which means I see you, te veo, I see you. But that's the, te so now a, a comic book is called a te veo because the magazine was called a te veo at, at that period. So they will send me issues and I will spend it like a kid reading to them. And when you are almost encapsulated in a house because you cannot go to so many places during the war, they give you a pencil and in my case, also a needle, because my mother was a seamstress. So I will embroider things, you know, or draw. All the time I was drawing. And because I knew what you were going to ask me, I found there was a character called Becassin, which was this, this lady, you know. 
there were, uh, this is a re reproduction, a more modern reproduction, but there was uh, all type of drawings. And my mother used to read them to me because it, French was my first language. So I remember her as my first influence in the field because they were drawn. And how about five years ago, I saw this on the, on the computer, they were selling a figurine. <laughs> of, that, of the character, so I immediately bought it, and uh, it, it it brings a lot of memories because that was first. And then the Tebeos, they were very Spanish stories, very bland, very nice. And then because of the there's no paper, it's uh, the paper to be available during the war. I will draw on the comics. I will just trace the characters in the comic book and learned how to, to draw tracing everything. And that was it, you know? And uh, when we, things start getting very bad, very hard for, for the Jewish people, for gypsies, for homosexuals, and for people who had fought against Franco, we had to leave. And one of the very only countries that accepted the Spanish refugees was Mexico. So I arrived in Mexico in 1942 and that was a total freedom of everything. You know, it was finding comics, finding books. My my uncle worked for the Spanish Republic Embassy, the, the Embassy of the Spanish Republic, because Mexico never recognized Franco. And uh, he could ask all that all the newspapers and things from Spain came, and he ordered El Tebeo, and they will arrive, and they will have it to me and then find things from Argentina. And uh, I was an avid reader of cartoons. And in Mexico, it was a, a plethora of, of comics in Spanish, humor in comics, and adventure, of course. So I devoured them. But I was more involved on reading books. You know, The Three Musketeers, uh, uh, The Trip to the Moon, The, the, the Prisoner of of uh, all, all the old classics, you know, uh, um, uh, Emile Sola, and all the, all, the, all the classics of many things, literature. And I will read things and imagine them. There was a, a writer, Italian, called Emile Salgari, Salgari, and he wrote about pirates. And in those times, really, there was not science fiction wasn't that popular, but Pirates was that thing to read. And I read them like there was no tomorrow. And I bought all his books about the, the great black pirate and the red corsary. And oh, it was so my imagination was filled with books, 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 books. And then that's what I drew. I drew my own adventures. That was very good. My uncle was a work for a uh, a, a factory that make yarn and they have these very large books that for the accounting they had all the, the accounting and the backs were white so he will be, be, be me the old books with so much paper so I will start my comics drawing what my mind was telling me about it and then this was more space here and I will continue like this and then I will turn it like that and then I will go here. So by the end of my story, you could see nothing. It was just a black thing of lines all over. Because I will draw it until the paper was saturated. Because I wasn't used to, to that they put squares, you know, on how to make it. But that gave me a, a, a sense of reproducing what I was reading, reproducing what it kept to my mind. And a lot of my early sketches when I was a kid, are airplanes bombing, uh, soldiers, seats of the war, and things that never get erased from your mind when you are raised in that environment. Like my mother, every time she heard an airplane running under the table, you know, even if he was in the war. That, that's what I was uh, going to ask you, Sergio, is uh, as a child growing up in France, um, you might, you were very aware of the situation. Was it something that you heard your family discussing around the table and at home? 
not only that, seeing them hiding, you know, and, and running away. And uh, they have sort of like a, an underground type of thing where they were raising rabbits, which they trade for other foods. You know, it's very vivid memories. And uh, when you arrive to Mexico, you arrive scared. You are afraid because suddenly everything is different. Everything is outside. And I didn't want to go out, you know, and my mother had to push me out to meet all the kids. And uh, of course, they make fun of your accent. <laughs> when, you, when you're a kid, kids make fun of things that so they are different. Not only kids, uh, Sergio, but... Um, while you were speaking, I was thinking about while the United States is so rich in their comic history, uh, political cartoons are, are something that has seemed to have sprung up everywhere because it's it's such a subversive way to to get a message across, to say two things at the same time. Was there any exposure to something like that uh, in either France or Mexico for you and your family? Well, um, they, in a way... All the refugees from the region that I was born, which is Valencia in Spain, they will meet. Some had arrived by ship before and some later, but there was a, very, a large community of Spanish because they, they, we were not allowed in any other countries. That uh, that they had a meeting in a, thing, in a place called La Casa Valencia, the Valencian house. And it happens to be on top of a theater, a very small theater, called El Cine Aladino, Al the Aladdin movie house. And they had all day running cartoons and the, the three Stooges movies and Laura and Hardy and, and uh, newsreels and things. So all the parents will put, a, will put all the kids there because babysitting at that time was out of the question. So they, we go to the theater and we sat there watching cartoons and movies, a whole group of kids, the, the kids of refugees, until the meeting was over and then they come and they pick us up. So we sat that sometimes for the loop started all over again. So we were saturated by the old black and white cartoons who really impressed me to a novel, to a point that there was, a, I have the character there, uh, which was a, a clown, Coco the Clown, which to me the thing that impressed me the most is that came out of an inkwell. You know, the guy will take the, the pen and dip it on the inkwell and start drawing, and the drawing moved. So I was convinced that that happened. I didn't understand any other thing, you know, I mean, at that age. So I asked my father to, to buy me an inkwell and a pen, you know, so he did. And... Uh, I tried it and it didn't work. So I asked my dad that that ink didn't work. So he had to get me a different one. So he got me a different inkwell. And again, I told him that it didn't work. You know, <laughs> it doesn't work. And when I told him that it didn't move, well, he had to explain to me that there's a process called animation, you know. And that was, ah, oh, because he told me that if you put a little drawing on a piece of paper and then you put a little one with a different movement, and then you move the people, the people back and forth. The whole thing move. I remember he telling stories of me screaming, of surprise, you know. And I was already six years old, you know. And, ah, like what this magic, you know, that the paper moves, you know. So that was a, a great thing, and and I keep drawing in all my school books. All of them had little cartoons that move, you know, from from that uh, effect of the page moving up. Back and forth. Then the flip books on the corner, you would flip them to make that. Yes. So that was to me that a great discovery. And I kept drawing, but um, never interested of it as a career. Never thought it was a career. That people make a living doing that, or people drawing it. I just drew. Never occurred to me that that could be a career, you know, that, that people will do that for a living. It was something I liked very much. I, I, I could, be, but what I liked the most was the, the cartoons without words that I understood very well in magazines. And uh, then I went to elementary school 
I made drawings for the kids. The, the homework was very easy then. The teacher would say, okay, chapter four, you draw, you write it and make a drawing of the, of the subject. And there was a homework. You take about the, the history, it was Hidalgo, the Mexican hero. Then you write what was on the book. You practice your calligraphy. You learn the history and you make a little drawing. But on the third grade, the kids didn't know how to draw. So I charged them five cents to draw them. And it worked, you know, all the kids make line and I, what is your assignment? The Mexican flag. So I would draw the Mexican flag for them or a hero or a, a butterfly or whatever it was the problem. And they show me in a book and I would do it for them. And of course the teacher find out immediately, you know, that I make enough money to buy me a set of toys. But my mother thought that I have stole it or something because she never gave me enough money to buy that toy. And I told her mother, I, I bought it with money that I made. So she didn't believe me. So she took me to the store to return the toy. And the, the guy says, no, he came with tons of coins and bought it. You know? Mother, who is? From that day on, never doubted anything I said to her. I want to kind of circle back to one thing real quick, Sergio, uh, tied to tied to this first question. You mentioned you mentioned when you uh, moved from as as a native Spaniard yes. from growing up in France, French became your first language. Yes, correct. Right? And then at six years old, I believe you yep. your family moved to to Mexico. Yes. The, the interesting part about that is that as a native. Spaniard moving to a country that also speaks Spanish. Yes. You did the hard way by learning French in between and it becoming your 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 well, you know primary language. Yeah, my Spanish was in my subconscious because that's what the, the family spoke. But I had a, a double trouble there because in Mexico, if you spoke Spanish Sp Spanish from Spain, is with the C and the Zeta like hunting is caza and a house is casa. In Mexico, they say hunting casa also. The C and the Z is not pronounced. So I couldn't talk Castilian with my Mexican buddies because they make fun of me. And I couldn't talk to my parents Mexican street because they will get mad at me. So I had to learn two types of Spanish, the, the Spanish way and the French and the, and the Mexican way. So the kids didn't make fun. So in the beginning it was hard. I was I went to a French school, a Mexican uh, Liceo Franco Mexicano, the Mexican Le Lycée Franc Mexicain, who was the French school. So I didn't forget my French. But it was a Spanish speaking country. It was a very well, very good school. And I did all my elementary school there, and uh, three years of high school, you call it secundaria in Spanish. And then preparatoria, the preparatory school, which will be your senior high, two years, I had to do in another school who was uh, uh, more specialized in the senior high. And then college, of course. But by then, the, the language had always a problem. I have a, a French accent when I speak Spanish with the R's, a very French R. So it's, uh, it's still... But the drawings always stay there. And when I went in high school, I started drawing the newspaper cartoons with gags. By then, the influences were French cartoonists that didn't use words. And uh, I was meeting Mexican cartoonists, and you start getting in contact with them. And uh, one day, the, one of the girls who was in class with me, this must have been in 54, 1954. I was in the first year of senior high. No, second year of senior high, right? Because I entered college in 55, engineering, which I didn't deal with that. So in 54, I was doing the newspaper and uh, that was the second college, uh, high school year. The, my friend, colleague, editor of the newspaper in the school took the cartoons to a Mexican magazine and she sold them. 
because uh, they asked me many times, are you going to be professional with this? I said, no, they are not professional. I work on the little magazine, which I must have sold nothing. And I didn't even know how to ink. One of the cartoons helped me to ink one to see how the, how it was done, you know, because mostly pencil. So it was a process though. Once it was sold as a professional, I knew I had a market. She invited everybody to, to go for lunch and to play bowling. Sergio is inviting me, inviting you guys. What? To the whole group of the newspaper. I don't have any money. He says, yes, you just sold these cartoons, you know. <laughs> so that was, the money came and went off in a lunch for all the guys with playing bowling at the bowling alley. But that was the first sale. So I went back, tried to sell more. Then I got a page in a magazine. I did covers for magazines. Uh, small magazines, articles, illustrations, things, a little of everything. And once in college, I started working for Manana, which I did uh, a, a weekly page that works very nice. Sergio, that's a, that's a very interesting transition to uh, my next question to you, uh, which is now let's jump forward. You, you've started working, doing these cartoons and getting some work. Now looking back, at the, uh, after a very long career, would you say you have faced A, no cultural or political feedback, or B, lots of cultural and political feedback with your work over the years? Both, because I had the, the feedback of, uh, of me meeting other cartoonists and going to a hotel that had a stand that sold foreign magazines. So every time we could, when we got out of, 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 of high school, we'll go there and to look at the magazines, you know, like Punch, we didn't understand a word of it. We love the drawings. They were exceptionally drawn, but not our style. They were very elaborate. Punch was very classical. So it had nothing to do for us. Then it was the New Yorker, which we couldn't understand either. Some cartoons were good because they were simple, but other were the classic humanoid cartoon type of thing, and, and it didn't appear. But then there were the French and German magazines that had a back page, always, every weekly, with cartoons without words, which we devoured because that's exactly how I felt about humor, that it had to be without words, because I could understand it from France and from other countries, the, the people who did that pantomime, mostly French. I have a book that I also think I, I took out for you guys to look at it. It's called, um, it's, it's a French book. It's called uh, Des Ans d'Humour, Drawings of, of Humor. And it has all, all pantomime cartoonists. And some of them are the ones that influenced me. And, and they are very basic, uh, Things like I do now, you know, this, you look at it and says, well, yeah, that, that, that's it, you know. And it, it is just a, a terrific influence on, on the work that I do based on these cartoonists, you know, that you took a little of them then, and then you draw them, you see. See the three generals are looking at a metal that's on the floor. <laughs> like they don't know who, who this is. You know? they, they, they've got a surplus of medals on them. Yeah, and they, oh, that's a, a bit of fell. I don't know. Is that yours? No, it could be mine. I don't know. I, I have one of those. <laughs> so I thought it was, I think their humor was fantastic. And uh, so I make a list of them. They were Bosque, Chaval, Francois, Moss, Tetsu, Res, cartoons that nobody heard about it in the States except if you like French humor without words, which is rare, you know? And uh, so th those were my, my really big influence. And there was a cartoonist from Argentina called Oski, which I follow him also because they were great. And he had the little eyes together. You know? <laughs> so it's just, you, you learn a little of everyone. You know, it's, uh, it's, you take a little things that you like from each cartoonist, you know? And eventually you develop your own, you know? And then, so once you do a weekly page, 
you develop a, a quick way to do that thing. And when you talk about the political thing, I was never interested in it because in Mexico, I will be always the foreign Spanish. You cannot do political. So that was not interested at all. When I came to the States in the early 60s, 62, 63, there was a, a Spanish magazine that was anti-Franco. It was called España Libre, Free Spain. And I did cartoons, political cartoons, against the, the dictatorship, against Franco. And that was taken very seriously by people who study that cartoon is in exile. And uh, I am one of the guys who did cartoon, political cartoons against Franco in exile. But it was in a way to help the family, help me to, to do that. But I was not really interested in the politic thing that you have to do yourself when you believe in a cause. You know, I have cartoonist friends in Mexico, Rius, who was such a political cartoonist, complaining about bad presidency, about the military, about everything that was bad, even bad, about religion, about food, everything that was bad. He made books. He made over a hundred books. Rius, R-I-U-S, Rius, a maestro. His cartoons were very loose, but the subject matter totally to the point that they took him, bandaged his eyes, and they took him to the field, and they were sounds of guns being crocked, telling him, well, say goodbye if you're Catholic, start praying. You're all bandaged. And then he couldn't hear anything, and they left. And after a while, he, he, he went like this to see, and he was all alone in the fields. They did that to him twice, you know, scary tactics. So... I could never get involved in the Mexican politics because it was not my politics. And in the United States, you cannot be both ways. You cannot defend something that is good or bad. You get published to the right if you are totally to the right. And if you are to the left, you barely can publish because there's not that many magazines to the left. They call you a communist. They call you bad names. And you cannot do that. So it's very difficult for people who have different opinions to be a total free speaker when you are doing political cartoons. You really have to believe in it. I have a cartoonist from Chile called Pepe Palomo, fantastic cartoonist. And he survived hiding in the, in the Mexican embassy in Chile before they kill all, all the other guys, drawing a comic strip called the, the Fourth Reich, El Cuarto Reich, about the tyrants in Chile, you know. He was suffering his self and his family, the problems. He saw the, 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 his friends being killed by a dictatorship in Chile. So, but he, that's what he does, and he does it excellently. You know, now there's not a dictatorship, so he does illustration and other kind. But you have to, to have that. Uh, that conviction the, and the passion, the conviction and the passion to do political cartoons. And my father says, "Don't get into politics; you'll get disappointed." You know. So, I find it interesting, kind of what you said about that, Sergio. Is that because you weren't a native uh, Mexican, you felt like it wasn't your place or position, maybe, or to have that passion to write a political cartoon or to draw a political cartoon about Mexico, that it may not have been accepted the same way if a Mexican cartoonist did it. Not only that, I knew it was not going to be bought. Immediately he says, who are you to tell us about our problems? There's a big separation. No matter how much you get into a culture, no matter how much, and we guys, you guys know it, there's always a little curtain there, invisible subtle, but it's there, you know? And uh, I'm probably more American now than anything else, you know, because I have lived here all my life and I have enjoyed 
this country uh, to, to, to the maximum. My wife's American, my daughter's. I mean, everything is American, that, everything I have, you know. But there's certain things that they should be fixed, but I cannot talk about it because there will always be the opposition who says you are not an American, even if your papers. Bob Hope was not an American and he was total American, you know. Yeah. He was born in Canada. So it's a, it's a always a little, and I particularly don't care to make political opinions because I will have to be doing it in a place where it doesn't matter, you know. And I'm not, I, I can see the bad in things. Political cartoonists, they are, they, they work with a bandage on their eyes. There's one opinion and that's it, because if not, they can publish. I don't touch politics at all, at all, at all. I did that in the 60s for Spain. And since then, I haven't done one, one, I, I criticize the social thing that happened, you know, but uh, no politics, no, no, no. That's fair enough. And then for, for, for Spain, was that where you felt the most comfortable that, hey, I am a native Spaniard, so? No, I was doing it for my father and because the, the, it was necessary to be done. You know, I, uh, I, I amold myself very good to what's happening all the time. Because there's things that will never be able to change. No matter how much you want, you can help, but you have to be so committed to whatever you want to do in a political field. You cannot be wishy-washy about it. Or you are to right or you are to left. It's, it, it's obvious, no matter where you go. Every country has the division. You know, and, uh, and that's how it is. You know? And it's logical. It has always been and probably will be always forever. The, the, if you don't re read history, you don't know that what's happening, it already happened. And you could correct your mistakes. So a lot of people are becoming more ignorant because they don't want to know about the past. It says, oh, I don't want to know about communism. Then how can you defend yourself from it? Not all the absurdity of certain things that they do in fascism and things like that. Once you know the results of it, you won't like it. So you'll start thinking more different. But they don't. So mistakes will be happening forever. Humanity doesn't change again. I'm sorry. I, interrupted you. I, I think it, it, that's exactly the point that struck me when I was reading your Bhutan story mm. and you, you, you saw the guru at the airport uh, oh, give yes. the gentleman a, a piece of fruit. And so you're in 1975, you're thousands of miles away from Mexico, but you see the same pattern of, of behavior and social um, normal norms in yep. Bhutan or in India that you saw yep. in uh, Mexico. And I was wondering how does realizing that at the end of the day, we're all the same, how did that impact your work when you approach something, when you're drawing about a different culture or something? Well, uh, to tell you the truth, it makes it very easy <laughs> because <clears throat> you apply what you have learned through the years to, to the end result. I, 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 I had a story that it took me a long, long time. I wanted to make fun of television. And Mark knows a lot of television too, so he could help a lot with that thing. But I couldn't find how to have make fun of TV and all the bad things that come with it. Until I, one day I'm watching TV and there's a puppet show, a marionette show. And it fit the TV, so I changed it instead of TV, a marionette. So that was the change of everything. So Gru invented all the bad things about marionettes. He wanted, he didn't want to stop watching the show. So he invented the, the, the food, takeout food, so he could eat while watching the show. All the things like that, all the problems and all the developments were done by that. A, pop a little children like the, the marionette, and he wanted one. So the guy in the audience started making toys 
of the marionette to sell it. Same thing with the majority of TV shows now. If you don't have a good toy contract to make the, 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 the toy selling, you don't sell your show. So all those things, and Mark helped me enormously with it because he knew what the bad things were about it. So instead of being TV, I translated it to, to television, you know. So that was a very interesting issue. And at the end, of course, everybody's watching the puppets and the dog, Ruferto, and a little boy are watching the sunset. And that's how the story ends, you know, with the two enjoying the sunset while the whole world is watching the, 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 the puppets. And like this, I have taken every modern things about gurus, about modern painting, about uh, homeless, about the problem with garbage. Every problem I have taken and translated into a, a, a time different because it's the same, the same problems. As a, as, a, as a writer yourself, as a storyteller, with your background, keeping your background in pantomime in mind, uh, how crucial do you think actual language is to the comic book genre? So uh, aside from simply cartooning, do you think, and you've had, I mean, your, your longevity is tremendous. So do you think it's possible to have had the longevity that you've had in, I don't know, say, for example, the superhero genre, uh, applying your for example, Mad Magazine principles of wordless storytelling. Do you think that that would have been possible? Well, the thing is, uh, there's certain logic in what you just said. A comic book is a combination of writing and drawing because you could not sustain a comic book monthly without words. It, it'll be a, a futility. Uh, uh, so I did one just as an exercise. But to, to make it like that, on the previous page, I always use Mark and, and, and uh, Stan Sakai and Tom Luth and myself telling them, oh, this is going to be issue number one or something joke about that issue. And in that issue, I says something that, no, no, I don't want any more dialogues. I, I can do it in pantomime or something. And I don't need you guys. The only guy I need is Tom Luth to do some color. I don't even need Stan Sakai. So I did a whole story. That 24 pages without words, because it was a whole joke about Gru arriving to a place in a castle and trying to invade it and build it out and then going on. a whole story without words. But that's it. You cannot do, I can do two, but maybe, but three or four or five or six, forget it. It's, it's a repetition. So comic book is the same, is, is the same evolution as movies. The, pan, the silent movies are excellent acting because you don't need a word to express but you always needed a little thing of what they were trying to convey you know they were not totally pantomime there were no words because they didn't know how to do it once the words came in they abused it with musicals and kind of thing but it took its place great conversation great dynamism between the the dialogue and the and the and the drawing i mean the the the, the scene the the the, the scene and in comics, we had the advantage that we could just write the dialogues and do it. To me, when I was writing comics, when I arrived to the States, I started writing before drawing for DC Comics. But I would write the same way I draw group. I will draw it. So I didn't have to draw. It was sunset. The sun was setting and the guy arriving a horse and the girl was walking with a jar in his head. I just draw it. it. Takes me less time to draw it than to say it. You know, so I drew it and put very basic dialogue. You know, where are you going? My ranch has been taken in by by Native American. Oh, I will defend you from it. I didn't have to write that. You know, I I left the editor. I will write it like that so he could be. Oh, my beauty, the sunset and you are alone. Where is happening with you? Blah 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 blah. They, everybody had always corrected my English and added the writing point of view to my story, like Mark does with, with Gru. I write the story, I, I write it, and then Mark takes over and puts that American accent on the dialogue. 
who makes it very funny. But he doesn't change the story. Many times Mark has come with a with a plot for a story and said, oh, that's great. But he do, just tells me what's about and then I go from there. So it's a beautiful collaboration that we have together. But the 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 fact that I don't write is because that's not my metier. You know, I, I, I can write a short thing, an intro for a friend or something. Well, I, I know that. I, I know my vocabularies and my 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 the great advantage is that it's the same in every language. The hard words are the same no matter what language you talk to. They have the same derivatives, Latin or Greek, you know. So once you know them, don't change. You understand what they mean. But it's that combination of drawing and writing that makes a comic what it is. And my idea of the comic book is that a great stepping stone for a young man who doesn't like to read, to understand the comic book, because he has to read a little and see the drawing. And if he goes in that level, the intelligentsia or the smartness start developing that the drawing is not necessary because his creation in his mind is better. So he can read a book and see it on his head, his way, without having to see it drawn. So that's the step that a guy who's going to become a writer can leave the comic book to become a reader of books, which is very important because the book allows your imagination to develop. You can see it with your own eyes, the Western town, the, 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 the train, the space, that you can imagine it as you're reading it, which is the beautiful thing about books. It allows you to imagine it. And sadness, if people don't read, they won't have a chance to let the inside of them imagination to see it their way. They have to depend on somebody writing it, drawing it for you, or filming it for you. They are missing half of life. And they don't know it. But they, the people who know it, they continue reading and imagine it, which is beautiful. Yeah. Sergio, uh, we're going to end it with something that really brings it back to what the essence of the show is. Um, and we're excited to share with others. Uh, without all these diverse experiences you've had, right? We've covered it. We've covered it ad nauseum now. Uh, without all those experiences you have, how different do you think your work would be? Um, if I could, if I could boil it down to one thing, if you had never left Spain, how different do you think your output as a storyteller, as a visual storyteller would be? Um, I'd be an engineer. You wouldn't be a storyteller. No, because you become a, you become a storyteller by your experiences, by things that happen to you by things that you like, by things that you uh, see. I, I think if I have a state, I will have, because on the time you have to be whatever your parents wanted you to be, I will have gone to college and become a normal thing. Probably I will have drawn because it was a, a natural thing, but I don't think I will have drawn as much because I didn't have any other thing to do. I will have been a free kid, do what other kids do. And because uh, I could have become an actor, I could have become so many other things. But I think that the, the contact with what other people did while I was a prisoner of my loneliness, let's put it that way, reading other things and seeing that is fun to do, you know, and you do it, but you don't do it well. My drawings are exactly average, like every other kid on that age. They are not better. They are not worse. They, they are just normal. And slowly, as you practice, you become better. And when you enjoy a cartoon so much that you want to copy his nose now a little more, you become that guy a little more. And then you you discover you discover people like uh, like like Virgil Parch, and then you want to become like him. You know, you change from Oski to 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 Virgil Parch because he, 
you love his exaggerations, you know. It's, oh my god, you know. And 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 then you start drawing things like this guy did. So if you stay in one place. You, you cannot change the future and you cannot tell what happened. You cannot change it that way because everything leads to another thing. You know, probably I could have been a cartoonist. Who knows? You can never tell what, what your life could have been. But one thing I can tell you is that the fact that I left, the fact that I went, the fact that I read other cultures, the fact that those influenced me, that is what made me. I know the people who are excellent cartoonists have learned from school, going to a cartooning school and learn. And if they are good, they become themselves. If they are just following what they learn, they will be just a repetition of his teacher. My father wanted to be first an engineer. And then when I was becoming tall and handsome, he wanted me to become an actor, which I didn't have the minus interest about it. I, I was at the theater group, but for other reasons. And it was a lot of fun, and I did, uh, I did some movies just because I was hired as a cartoonist for the producing company. But they, oh, you, 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 come on, you have to be on the show. I was in a show called Laughing because the, the producer hired me as a, to write the cartoons for the show. You know, not only cartoons but jokes as a, for the thing. And then he says, "Well, you have to do that. You're perfect for that part." So suddenly, I was an actor in. In the, in the six uh, one-hour specials that they did of laughing after, when they re the regular Rowan and Martin stopped, they did one with Robin Williams. So I was with, working parallel with Ro Robin Williams for about a year, doing a, a new show, six issues. But I was hired as a, as a writer, writing gags for the show. But I ended being part of the show. And it was fun. But it was not... When I finished, I didn't go to get an agent to try to be in a movie at all, you know. So everything that I've done, that has been in relation by knowing somebody or because I fit the part. And it was fun, but not as a career. I have a career that I wouldn't trade for anything. I have never worked a day in my life. It's true. It's, if you consider this work, well, wow, what a job, you know. <laughs> well... I think we're going to leave you here, Sergio. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us, for, for sharing oh, your please. experiences, your stories. It really was an absolute honor to, to have oh. you here today. Thank you, guys. Well, I hope some people who watch this, they could learn something or appreciate something else. You know, How could they not, Sergio? How could anyone this hopes. and not this hopes. learn something from what, so. from what we've gone so. through today? Uh, to echo what... To echo what Mikhail said, uh, really, this has been a tremendous treat. If you had told the six-year-old or the five-year-old Aranga who was reading Mad Magazine and looking <laughs> at your drawings that, hey, at 44 years old, you will be interviewing the man who kind of gave you the chuckles and, and then, you know, <laughs> uh, helped you do that. So really, a rare, a rare and incredible treat. Uh, thank you for the generosity of your time. Uh, for coming on with us. My pleasure, always, always. Well, Iranga, that was absolutely a treat. I cannot believe how much ground we covered and how much there's still left to learn about his amazing life. I, I feel like there's there's no way. I mean, there's there should be three more shows. Uh, absolutely, two. It's it's a life. It's a life lived. Let's just put it that way. Uh, and I've lived, it's, well it's, lived, and all over the world. Yep, a hundred percent. And I could we have done a better job getting someone for the for the for the theme of this show? Could we have found a a better person to have kicked this off? I I, I don't think it's possible. And uh, in that vein, thanks to all of you out there joining us for this inaugural episode of Drawn This Way. We hope to have some more fantastic shows for you coming up soon, and we hope you'll join us for those. Thanks, everyone. We, uh, we appreciate you guys joining us and hopefully uh, a lot more to come in the future. A special thanks to our friend Ken at 4C and to George Hodge for the fantastic music that accompanied this show. Mm -hmm.